our Lord continues to press forward in terms of his mission. So you look here at Matthew 17, towards the end, you find that they're gathering in Galilee, they're moving towards Jerusalem. The setting is we are approaching Passover with the tax collection of the temple tax. And so we're, we're getting to the point in the Gospel of Matthew where Christ is about to fulfill the essence and identity of his mission. And so as Christ is going to fulfill this mission and, and do this very task, it does remind us of where the Gospel began with the genealogy of Jesus Christ reliving the history of Moses or the history of Israel. And so you think about Moses, where does he start with Israel? He starts in Sinai, he ends in Deuteronomy when he passes away. That's his farewell discourse. And so Matthew has seemed to organize his gospel somewhat similarly in the sense that the public ministry of Christ begins with the Sermon on the Mount. And now we move to a new section of what we can call kingdom ethics or cross ethics, uh, where Christ is laying out what it means to be a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, and what it means for one to bear their cross, as this becomes very much the symbol of Christianity. And so as Christ, like Moses, is coming to the conclusion of his life, uh, he's talking about the implications of this kingdom, how do we find our joy in life as human beings who are called to submit to Christ. You, you think about what that means, that we're actually called to empty ourselves of all significance and find our significance in our Savior. This is not something natural for fallen man. And yet this is the call of the gospel. How can this truly be joyful? Well, when we ask that question, we hear first of the suffering Savior, the suffering shalom, or the suffering peace, and lastly, the suffering servant or the suffering servants. And so let's begin with the suffering Savior. As the text tells us and Matthew tells us, we're moving again. We're making our progress toward Jerusalem. This isn't as deliberate as in Luke's gospel, for instance, where Christ turns his face to Jerusalem, looking to the cross and the outcome of the cross. Christ is going to Jerusalem is the implication and as he's going to Jerusalem, he's telling his disciples something. And this is where I wanted to leave off or pick up from this week and stop last time we were in Matthew. Because this is setting the, the tone, setting the stage uh, for the nature of this kingdom ethic. Because Christ is once again telling his disciples that the Son of Man is going to be handed over and delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, he will die, and he will be raised up. And so... When Christ says this, he's again reminding us that, listen, the, the cross was not a detour. It was not an accident. It wasn't plan B. It wasn't an alternative route. That is the destiny. That's where Christ is going. And he has to go to the cross at the Passover. He has to be the Passover Lamb of God. He's got to relive the history of Israel. He's got to once again relive our history. He's got to be that perfect redeemer and he has to offer himself in our place. And so now there's, there's this pressing issue with the disciples. Are they going to see this cross as something of success? That this is uh, testifying to the success of Christ's ministry, much like we talked about with Good Friday uh, last week? Or are they going to see this cross as a failure in the mission of Christ? And you notice that there's a contrast in how Christ views the cross and how the disciples view the cross. Because now when they're in Galilee, this is placing us back in Nazareth. Or around the last time they were in Galilee was when Christ went into the synagogue in Nazareth. Uh, and we had there that the people of Nazareth were not very receptive of Christ. Where he said, a prophet is without honor in his hometown. But now as he's coming back to Galilee, he's saying again, listen, this is the outcome of my mission. I will be handed over to death and I will die. Now this is generic. We don't know here explicitly who's going to take him, but he's going to go on more explicitly uh, in 20 verse 18 and identify it as a chief priest and the scribes. They'll deliver him over to the Gentiles. And so notice Christ is conscious that it's not the Gentiles who are going to say, we need to stop or silence this mission. 
It's actually, again, a reminder of the leaders of Israel rejecting the very incarnate word and saying that this word that comes from God, this canon that comes from God, is not the canon we wanted or we desired. Therefore, we're going to hand him over to men. He's going to die because we do not like him. But the important thing to remember is this is not accidental. Christ knows this is his fate. He knows this is his destiny. Now notice how he identifies himself again as the son of man. But it's the son of man being handed over into the hands of men. Uh, This is not, as we mentioned, identifying anyone who is going to do this. It's not identifying particularly the chief priests and leaders of Israel. But this being handed over communicates something that's passive. Christ is not active in this. He's, he's done his active work, and by this moment that he gets handed over, Christ is one is to be handed or is to die on the cross. And as he's to die on the cross, he is to do that very mission to save his people from their sins. This is where Matthew's gospel began. It began with that call of Jesus entering history to save his people from their sins. He has to go to the cross. He has to be killed. And so notice how these are passive things. Christ, like his sacrifice, like the Lamb of God, as the servant songs predicted, he's going to go and he's going to die and he's going to be simply one who is led around. But once again, this Son of Man, this recalls for us who Christ is. Uh, So often we can just talk about the incarnation and God entering history, but minimize the significance of the flesh. Christ really is entering history. Matthew's gospel, Christ is cast as a second Israel, a new Israel, a new people. A people that undergo a, a true redemption starting at Sinai, ending at the goal of Zion. And, and, and the way to get there is through the cross of Christ. And so for Christ being the Son of Man, he's emphasizing this truly is the incarnate word. Uh, This is the understanding that it's the incarnate word that enters history. So a lot of times we think of John's gospel. The word became flesh, tabernacled amongst us. Uh, We talked about that Good Friday as well. Matthew also has very much a a Christology consistent with John, which is what we would expect. Uh, This is Orthodox Christianity. It has to be God and man to take an eternal sanction. And he has to be man. He has to relive the footsteps of man. And so for Matthew, this is the new Israel, the new man who is accomplishing his mission and doing this particular task. And so as Christ is uh, doing this task and fulfilling this mission, uh, he's the one who's uh, fulfilling that expectation. He's a son of man who is doing this very deal. But now there's something else uh, about this, that Christ predicts what we know. We know he must save his people from their sins. But there's something else. We have the sons of man. Uh, What I mean by that is that you have the lowercase sons, uh, those who are the disciples who hear this very reality. And they react to this. You know, Christ has to come, save his people from their sins, die on the cross. Something that in terms of, of a Christian life that we say this is where we find hope. We teach this to our children, and it's a wonderful thing. It's a true thing to teach our children. But for us, it's become so cliche, so ordinary, that we don't understand how radical this is. That the the cross is not something that would be testifying to success. Uh, This is where failures go. This is where people who lose sight of reality end up. And so these disciples hear this message. He's going to be handed over. He's going to be killed. And as they hear this, they, they, they don't know what to do. They hear and this message, and they're, they're greatly distressed. Um, the force of this word is, is falling into an intense depression, uh, falling into an intense grief. Uh, one, in some contexts, hearing of the, the heinousness of their sin being cut to the heart and having this intense sorrow, this intense grief, uh, much like, like David when, when he comes to grips with all that he's done and his moral failure. And this is the reality of where the disciples are. It's not that they're finding their own moral failure in this, but they're, they're grieving. They're, they're already grieving the loss of Christ without understanding the significance of this mission. They only hear death. Uh, 
they only hear handed over. They only hear killed. They only hear this language. But there's something else Christ tells them that I've skipped over. That this movement of being handed over to death ends up with something else. That Christ will be raised to life. Christ gives that significant promise. Because you see, for the Son of Man in Daniel 7, it's not just the suffering servant who comes to die, but it's the Son of Man, ancient of days, joined together, who comes to suffer so he can be raised up to glory, to come back as a glory king, to execute and bring about that definitive judgment, and to bring his people into their rest, to secure it, to, del- to definitively deliver them from all their heinousness and sin. But the disciples failed to understand the significance of this resurrection. And so the the posture we find is a posture where one should say, my redemption, my life, my joy is found only in Christ. My joy is found in that I serve a resurrected Savior. However, Christ is here introducing that concept of this Christian service. Because it's a service that's characterized by the cross. It's characterized by a focus from this life of suffering and conforming to Christ and the power of the Spirit and being raised to life and once again finding our joy and comfort in the Lord who will come again and secure us. And so these disciples then are not understanding the suffering servant. They're not understanding the nature of redemption and what it means for Christ to save us from our sins. So now we move on And we find that as the disciples travel, they come to Capernaum. This is where we find the suffering shalom or the suffering peace that's going on. That as they move to Capernaum, they are those who encounter the temple tax collectors. Uh, Now keep in mind, these aren't necessarily villains. Uh, These are not tax collectors like Matthew from the Roman government. Uh, These would be tax collectors that would be in charge of the tax that was due in Exodus 30, 13 through uh, 16. Uh, Basically, this is a tax that's tied to one making an atonement for their lives. Uh, So one would pay this tax, and as part of Passover, where one would recognize that here I need to make this atonement, I need to make this payment, and as I make this payment, uh, I'm not sacrificed, I don't die, I end up experiencing experiencing the deliverance of God. And so this, this tax, as it's going on, is this reminder that here we're close to Passover, getting close to the cross, close to the end of Christ's ministry. Uh, it's also telling us that as these tax collectors go out, or simply doing their job, this is what they would do. And so we have these men who come to Christ, and they ask Christ about it. And as they ask Christ about it, you, you say, okay, well, Here they are making this request. And as they make this request, we we, we may say, okay, well, are these Pharisees? Are these Sadducees? Are these, who who are they? Well, most likely it would be the Pharisees or the chief priests who would have sent these men. Uh, These are probably uh, just temple officials. They probably don't know much about Christ. They probably heard that Christ is a rabbi. They've probably heard that he's a teacher of some sort. He has some disciples. And as they come to encounter Christ, these men who probably have no dog in the fight uh, come to Peter and approach him. Again, Peter the spokesman for the disciples. And as they approach Peter, they want to know, you know, does your, does your rabbi pay tax? Some rabbis, you had different teachings where people would say it's a one-time tax or they'd say this is not a tax we need to continue to to pay you know maybe it's not a true temple Uh, we don't see this as Solomon's temple therefore we're not paying the tax so as they come to Christ they're basically you know asking a most likely an honest inquiry an honest question but they want to know is Christ some sort of radical teacher is he some sort of radical exclusivist or maybe he's some sort of a insurrectionist stirring up a rebellion and so as they approach Christ you know there's no doubt they're sent by the Pharisees so if they come to Peter and Peter says oh no no our Lord doesn't pay the tax the Pharisees are going to all of a sudden take this and say see he's a radical He's not one who follows the true requirements of Moses. He's, he's a deviant. He's not someone you need to listen to. Here we go again. Here's more evidence that this isn't the Christ that you should follow. 
And so, in the Pharisees' minds, they probably think, once again, we got Christ. <clears throat> Here we put him in a predicament. He says he's the Lord of the temple. He says he's the Son of God. Clearly, the Son of God's not going to want to pay the tax. And so, if the Son of God says no to these tax collectors, we can get the crowds stirred up. Christ comes to Jerusalem. It's pretty easy to get rid of this guy. He's not going to be a problem. And so, Peter tells these individuals, yes, uh, my, my master does pay the tax. So now, Peter has answered, there's not much delay. <clears throat> so the implication is Peter is probably with Christ or whatever, because, or maybe he's reported to Christ. Matthew doesn't tell us exactly how Christ knows of this inquiry. Most likely, Peter and Christ are uh, near each other, and Christ has seen this interaction. So these uh, tax collectors or temple tax collectors go away, not the Roman tax collectors. And as they... Uh, go away, Christ now turns to Peter. And he asks Peter this important question. He says, you know, when a, when a king, or what do you think about this, Simon? And then he says, now I, I want to ask you something. When, when there's a king who collects taxes, does he collect those taxes and, and collect the spoils or the toils of the kingdom from his sons or from the citizens? Peter said, well, you know, normally it's, it's from others. It's from the citizens, or maybe he goes to war and he takes some spoils from war. So it's not his sons that are doing the toiling. A, a king is going to acquire these things from others. Okay, Christ says, that's fine. And so the reality is then the sons are free, right? So think about what, what Christ is doing here. He's affirming the reality of who he is. This temple tax is testifying to an atonement at the time of Passover, Who's the one who ultimately pays a debt for us? Who's the embodiment of the temple? Christ himself. And so Christ is saying to Peter, here's the reality. We're not bound to this. And so as I'm the temple, as I'm the one who secures the, the reality of this kingdom, understand, don't superstitiously look at this tax. Don't look to this temple for life. You need to look to me. I'm the one who establishes the promises of God, not the temple. Served its purpose, God was with his people in the midst of the temple, no doubt. But it's not the full reality of this promise. And so, as Christ says that, we say, okay, well then, Peter's going to go back, right? And say, well, you know, we don't pay the tax. I spoke at a turn, shouldn't have said what I said. Christ now turns to Peter and says, but we don't want to give an offense. Now, isn't this strange? I mean, here, the Pharisees most likely sent this man, or at least the chief priests, and all these individuals are... Uh, not necessarily fans of Christ. In fact, they desire to kill him. And so Christ is not scared to offend the Pharisees. 11.6, he says, Blessed are those who are not offended by me in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 11.6, 13.57, the offense that he brings to Nazareth, where the people in the synagogue say, who is this guy to talk? This guy, you know, his dad's a, a carpenter. I mean, who, who is this guy? All of a sudden he's a rabbi. Why, why should we listen to him? In 1512, the rebuke of the, from the disciples because the Pharisees were offended by Christ. So the disciples turned to Christ and said, Christ, I think you offended the Pharisees. This is bad. Christ doesn't go and do anything about it. He just says, too bad. And so why is Christ now all of a sudden concerned about offending these tax collectors who are most likely sent by the Pharisees anyway, probably on some sort of a ruse or some sort of a mission. Now, these men are most likely sincere, but the Pharisees, again, they, they have another motivation behind this. Well, Christ not wanting to offend these individuals. Why? He wants them to understand he is a legitimate Messiah. And so he does this miracle that troubles commentators. And it, it is somewhat strange because when Christ is being tempted, he doesn't do a miracle of convenience uh, for Satan to simply prove who he is, which he could easily do. But here we find that Christ does this miracle of convenience. He tells Peter not to cast a net, but to cast a hook. So he's going to catch one fish, not a variety of fish. It's not pull up a net, you know, catch a bunch of fish, and then the first fish you pull out of the net is a fish that's going to have the temple tax. No, it's one hook, one fish, first cast is the implication. And then this tax is paid. And so the implication is Peter goes away and he pays the tax. But still, there's that lingering question. Why is Christ all of a sudden concerned about offending? 
Well, you think about this in terms of the Apostle Paul with the eating of the meat in 1 Corinthians. It seems that the people of Corinth ask him about this, and he addresses this issue about the eating of the meat. And there's two scenarios. The one scenario, you may have people where, you know, they have a background, they may be Jewish. There's no temptation to do idol worship. They didn't go to the temples, they didn't participate in the temple worship. That meat means nothing to them. And so they're free to eat the meat. Now there might be someone that says, well, my conscience doesn't allow it, but they were never part of the temple worship. They just simply say that I'm not going to eat it because I'm trying to take a moral stance. Well, then in that situation, an individual can say, well, it's great. I'm still going to eat the meat. I'm not going to cause you to stumble. And so the person is not going to be ruled by the weaker brother. It's not the weaker brother that's determining the conscience of the whole congregation in that situation because the person's not truly a weaker brother. However, there's another scenario Paul lays out that maybe there is someone in the congregation who went to this temple and this individual is trying to put to death that idolatrous uh, pagan worship he was part of for a number of years of his life. And now he goes into a home where someone may have a Jewish background, uh, may be confident and completely sure of who they are in the Lord, and that person serves them the temple meat. Well, this person's going to go back to, wow, this was the temple. I remember this, um, all the sentimentalism that's going on there. I remember going here with my family. And that person may legitimately fall into sin and fall back into the temple worship. In that scenario, one should not have the temple meat. Because you're going to cause this individual to truly stumble in their Christian faith in the sense that they will fall into sin and go back to pagan worship. So now going back here with Christ, it seems that's the principle here. Pharisees, if they're offended, too bad. Christ is a Messiah. He's the embodiment, the incarnation of the canonical word of God. They want to reject him. They've heard John the Baptist. They've heard Christ. They will not open the scriptures and consider it. These men who come to Christ and Peter, or most likely to Christ and Peter, are those men who are legitimate Jewish people, legitimately desiring to maintain the sanctity of the temple. Christ doesn't want to lose credibility with them. He wants them to understand he truly is the Christ and the Messiah. And so he goes and he does this miracle of convenience so that now the Pharisees can't stir up these individuals and have it so that when Christ goes to Jerusalem, they say, yeah, he's a guy, he's a radical man. This guy is, is like the other radicals we've seen that doesn't want to be part of this Jewish worship. So now you, you would think, okay, so Christ makes this concession even as a Passover lamb of God doing this very thing, you think, well, this, this is great. You know, Christ is showing how there is this, this desire to, to maintain this, this, um, this love for these individuals. There, there's that suffering shalom, that suffering peace that Christ is willing to live out of in terms of a cross ethic. <clears throat> you would think that the disciples would process this. But now we have this brief narrative. Again, as these seem disconnected, I would argue that when you understand the start of the cross, you end at this in 18 verse 5, you understand the basic essence of this cross ethic. Because now the disciples come around and they say, Hey, uh, Lord, who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So you think about that, you know. It's, you think of the inner three who have seen the transfiguration. They've seen Christ, they've seen Moses, they've seen Elijah. Clearly those guys got to be in there, right? They got to be the top guys. But then you do have the other disciples where they try to do the miracle and they stayed behind. So the implication is they're probably doing some teaching and they're doing some stuff when Christ is off doing whatever with, with the other three. So these guys might also be pretty significant because, you know, they're doing teaching and they're trying to do some miracles. They had one that didn't go so well, but they're doing other things. So, so they're important too, Right? And so this, this question that they ask becomes rather troubling. Christ is saying, here I am as the son of man, ancient of days, coming into history, not going to Jerusalem to make war as one would expect. I'm going to the cross. Here we have the Pharisees. I know they're trying to set me up and they're doing stuff most likely behind the scenes here. But yet we're just going to do this miracle so we don't unnecessarily offend uh, these legitimate tax collectors. And now... We have the disciples respond, okay, so we heard about the cross, we heard about your suffering, shalom, so now, Lord, tell us, who's really greatest? We need to know. 
Well, Christ doesn't pick one of the disciples. Christ doesn't say, well, obviously it's John. It's John identifies himself as a beloved disciple. It's not Peter, the impulsive, um, zealous one. It's not James. But he does something else. He calls his child to himself. And this child is anonymous. In fact, this child is so anonymous in the text that on the day when the Lord brings us into glory and we enter into his presence in the fullness, we won't know who this child is most likely, even in glory. You know, there's, there's no promise that the Lord's going to say, and here's a child that I use as an analogy. We don't know the child's family. We assume the child's most likely Jewish because of where they are. Uh, we most likely assume that this child is genealogically tied to Abraham, but, but we don't know that for sure. We just know he grabs a child. And as he takes his child, who's anonymous, who has no name, no significance, but only becomes significant because Christ calls attention to him right now. And he says, unless you become like children, and basically like this child, whoever humbles himself, whoever is willing to take up his cross, basically, is the one who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now when Christ says this, he's reminding them, first of all, it's the kingdom ethic of seek first the kingdom of God. What it means, as he said, I believe in chapter 10, that in order for one to find their life, they must first lose their life. That's the point here. That if one's going to try and find significance in self, in this kingdom, in Christ, one's missed the kingdom. Christ is saying, do you understand why I'm here to save you from your sins? I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. And then I'll be raised up. Yes. But I'm going to suffer and die. And now you're asking me, <clears throat> who's the greatest? Who's the most significant? You need to be anonymous. You need to empty yourself of all significance. And when Christ says this, and he says, unless you turn, uh, this is basically where we get repentance. And what repentance means is that we, we change one's mind. We change one's orientation. Uh, we change one's heart to have a, a refocused purpose. And he's saying to his disciples, when you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answer. If you're asking, well, how, how am I going to be the greatest? Well, now you're asking in terms of this a worldly ethic where you just need to do more, you need to be more competitive, you need to basically take the ethic of the early bird gets the worm, etc., and these sorts of things. Or does being the greatest mean you just simply serve Christ? And Christ is saying, if you're going to ask who's the greatest, you need to change your whole mindset. You don't need to ask myself or, or yourself, how do I become great? You need to ask yourself, how do I take on the yoke of Christ more consistently? How do I live before the cross of Christ? How is the cross of Christ my ethic in my Christian life? How am I becoming more anonymous in finding my significance in Christ? Now, this is radical. This is not what fallen man naturally desires. And that's what Christ is saying to the disciples. You, you want to know what this Christian life is? It's that continual contentment to be anonymous. That continual contentment to find significance only in Christ. And to understand that's where life is found. And again, it's that reminder as you receive the humble one, as you receive the insignificant one, as you receive this child in Christ's name, so you're receiving me. This is the one who becomes greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the one who understands the cross is not an obstacle, not a barrier. It's a necessity of the mission. Because that cross leads to resurrection. And that resurrection is a resurrection life that Christ is giving to us. And so Christ is saying, listen, this is simply what I've said. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness will be added unto you. It's not saying this is a health and wealth secret. It's just saying, what's your priority? Your priority right now is to ask yourself, how do I serve Christ more consistently? How do I serve Christ in light of him being my redeemer, the one who has paid for my sins? Uh, it's also what 
Christ has told us in terms of, of this life that one has to have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. Scribes and Pharisees, they're, they're fighting about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But Christ has said, it's not enough. The only righteousness that's going to be sufficient is a righteousness of Christ. This is a righteousness that you must take hold of by faith, of the Son of Man who has gone and who has suffered and who has died, who has been raised to life. But it's also the understanding that one has their notion and uh, comprehension that it's not dealing with the specks in other people's eyes. But it's again dealing with that log in our own. What are the logs I need to deal with? What do I need to bring before my Savior? But in terms of Christ saying this, this uh, anonymous life that we live in him, it's understanding that life has to begin and end in Christ. If it does not begin and end in Christ, we have nothing, period. That's it. There is no life. There is no hope. Our redemption, our righteousness, our power has to come from that cross and it has to come from that resurrection that Christ has accomplished once for all. As we live out this gospel, we need to continually conform to that heavenly call as his redeemed. <clears throat> and so, if this kingdom is teaching us about finding joy and living our life before the Lord, how, how can this really be joyful? Well, it's understanding we're not living for self. This is a struggle of fallen man. This is the promise that Satan gives to Adam and Eve. You can determine what's right and wrong. But Christ is saying we don't determine what's right and wrong. We desire to live more consistently in light of who we are in Christ. And we struggle to do that. And we do it in his resurrection power and the confidence of his redemption taking all our sins away. And then we continue to, prove, to move forward. It's understanding that as I empty myself of my significance, I gain significance in Christ because it's only in him that I can have a place in this kingdom and undergo the true Passover. It's a posture of understanding why did Christ enter history? He entered history to take away my sin. He entered history to die for me. He entered history to be raised to life for me. And as he enters history to be raised to life for me, it's a call for me to live as his redeemed servant who has been made alive. This isn't just for me as a pastor exclusively, but I'm saying me in terms of all of us, saying the same thing. That if Christ has to enter history to take away our sins, it means I have sin. It means you have sin. And it means the sin needs to be taken away and it's only taken away in him. And the true joy of living life is only living life in our Lord as we have been redeemed and made alive in Christ. Amen. Thank you for subscribing and listening to our podcast. We hope and pray that our sermons encourage you as you sojourn on your Christian walk. If you have any questions about our church, please contact our pastor through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. That is urcbelgrade.com. We also have many sermon series archived and available for download on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.